Mark 15, we're going to read verses 21 to 41. As we look at the crucifixion and death of our Savior, His birth is being widely celebrated in this season. Remember, he was born to die. He was born to save. He was born to be nailed upon the tree. I hope you found Mark 15 in your Bible. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And follow along as I read. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put the text on the screen for you. And would like to talk with you about how we can get a Bible to you. You need your own copy of the Scriptures. Follow along as I read. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them, to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Younger, James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer is that this grips us anew and afresh. That it changes the way we see the baby of Bethlehem. To see him in the fullness of who he is, who he came to be, what he came to do. Thank you. Please be seated. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is arguably the greatest crime ever committed in the history of the world because it was perpetrated on one who was completely innocent. I don't know if you can appreciate that. You know, growing up, this may have happened to you. There were times growing up when I got spankings that I probably didn't, shouldn't, shouldn't have gotten, didn't deserve, and I know for a fact my children have <laughs> been on the receiving end of spankings they didn't deserve. But you know what? My, there were spankings that I should have gotten that I didn't get. So I can't stand here today and say that I was over spanked, spanked too much. There were times when I should have been corrected, and I wasn't. But Jesus was perfectly innocent, perfectly sinless. He, he did not deserve what he received. At the same time, this greatest crime in the history of the world is the very place where God executed his divine justice by pouring out his holy wrath upon Jesus, who stood as our substitute. It's in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that Jesus satisfied God's divine justice by his suffering and dying in our place. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 3, verses 
24 to 26, he's talking about that we being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The, we see at the cross God's holy wrath, his holy justice mixed with his remarkable mercy and grace. He does what he does to Jesus so he may maintain, maintain his holy character, his just character, and at the same time be placed in a position where he can justify, that is, declare sinners not guilty and accept them as righteous in his sight, not for anything they have done or we have done or could do or did not do, but simply only for the sake of who Jesus is and what he came to do. You know, at Jesus' birth, a lot of things happened around that, the angelic appearances and proclamations. And Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple as was prescribed by the law. And Luke 2, 25 to 35 captures this encounter with a man named Simeon. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's another way for saying waiting for the Messiah to come. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when his parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. This, this is known in Latin as the nunc dimittas, now, now I can depart. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And then he said this to her, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And what we read today in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the occasion where his mother had her own soul pierced as she saw her darling put to death unjustly. I want us to see in this text today, uh, as time allows, four considerations. First, that Jesus is taken to Golgotha. Second, Jesus is taunted by his accusers. Third, Jesus experiences the wrath of God. And fourth, the immediate response to the death of Jesus from some different perspectives. First of all, he's taken to Golgotha. Look at verses 21 and 25. They compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. There's a powerful picture here of this Simon of Cyrene. Uh, there was, by the way, a, uh, as we find in Romans and in, the, in the Acts, a uh, constituency of Jews in this place called Cyrene. This, this Cyrenian synagogue is referenced in the New Testament. So he, he has come, no doubt, to celebrate uh, the Passover and all that attends that, Passover all the way to Pentecost. He's compelled to carry the cross beam of Jesus. And it becomes for us, uh, this, this cross beam weighed 30 to 40 pounds, typically the condemned man would carry that as well. But it becomes for us a visual image of true discipleship that Jesus demanded when he said, be ready to take up your cross. So you have this power, there's a lot of images through this that, that are themselves teaching us and ratifying and verifying the teaching ministry of Jesus. And so they bring him to this place called Golgotha. It's called the place of the skull. And the, the name is there people have conjectured because perhaps it, it, from a distance it looks like a human skull. 
uh, or perhaps because it's not far from it, the remains of those crucified were tossed and it would have become a, a boneyard, really. But there he is, this ominous place called the place of the skull. And they offer him wine mixed with myrrh. It's a, it's a sedative. It was designed to dull the pain. But he refused it. Jesus prayed in the garden, if it's possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. But Jesus would not turn away. He would not dull his experience. He was going to face the full pain and the full intensity of the fury of wrath for us. Such wondrous love. What, what wondrous love is this? That caused the Lord of bliss to bear my pain, my sin. And there we see him, even in his deepest hour of agony, refusing relief because he was the one who had come to bring relief. He said in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So they, verse 24 says, they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. So remember they had clothed him in purple, they stripped that from him when they finished mocking him there. They, they put his garments back on him, took him to the cross, and then they stripped him naked. There he hangs. That's why I've said in the past, really, there's, no, there's no passion play you can go to, no, no movie that, that will, will capture the full indignity perpetrated upon Jesus. There he hangs, exposed, as they gamble for his garments. And we, we read from Psalm 22, that, that messianic psalm, which, which begins with his cry of, of abandonment. He says in the course of it, they, they gambled, cast lots for my clothing. So these were the spoils of execution reserved for the squad that carried out the execution. I've told you before that crucifixion, I won't go through it again today, but it, is, it was the cruelest form of, of capital punishment uh, that they could devise uh, in that day. Uh, it could be argued that later on draw, being drawn and quartered uh, was also uh, intense in that way. But crucifixion was, was typically took three or four days for the victim to die. And he would die by death by asphyxiation. Sometimes fluid pooling up in his, so he would, he would literally drown in asphyxiation as he hung on the cross. And we're told that, that this happened at the third hour, or if you're counting Roman time, it's about 9 a.m. The day began at 6, the first hour. The third hour would be 9 a.m. And so there he is crucified. The second thing I want you to see is he's taunted by his accusers as, as he's hanging there. This, this inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And if you read John's gospel in the, in the attending uh, synoptics, Matthew and Luke, you'll piece together a chronology. I would encourage you to do that. In fact, I've, I've put one together. If you would like to have that, let me know and we can send that to you. It's a chronology of the four gospel accounts surrounding this. But you'll remember from the other accounts that it was, it was in uh, Greek and Latin and Aramaic uh, above him. So uh, at a crossroads where people of different languages would come, they would read King of the Jews. And the, and the Jewish leaders said, don't put King of the Jews. Put up there that he said he was King of the Jews. And Pilate's response was, remember what I have written stands written. It will remain just as I've written. So, so even, in the, even in the mocking and all this, the declaration is there. The gospel is going forward uh, unwittingly, unintentionally. God is overseeing it and ensuring that that will happen. We're told that they crucified him between two robbers. The word, the word there is more generally spoken of as criminal, and, and commentators go back and forth about the, whether or not they were thieves because it would have been not, not been customary to, to crucify thieves unless they were really uh, sort of serial thieves, habitual thieves. Uh, but they were criminals who'd been deemed worthy by the Roman government of execution, and there they hang next to him. And the scripture again is fulfilled that he was numbered with the transgressors from Isaiah 53. So there he is. Though perfectly innocent, he hangs with two who were perfectly guilty. And to the undiscerning eye and the hard and cold heart, there was no difference. They, they saw two criminals 
flanked, flanking a, another criminal, a seditionist, a, a blasphemer, an insurrectionist. So those passing by, those who saw the spectacle were deriding him, wagging their heads and saying, and remember we just read this in Psalm 22, the, the Messianic Psalm of Psalm 22 forecast and predicted, though David was speaking of himself in a lot of ways, it, it forecast and, and predicted that these things would come from the mouth. Jesus is very keenly aware in the midst of great suffering that he is fulfilling scripture. So they're saying, aha, you who could destroy the temple, destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, which of course is a, is a malicious misrepresentation of what he actually said. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. It sounds very much like uh, what, uh, what the devil tempted him to do in the wilderness. If you are the son of God, go to the pinnacle of the temple. Leap from there. Angels will come and rescue you, and people watching that will be convinced when they see the angels attend to you that you've come from God. It's a temptation there. Come down from the cross. The chief priests joined in. He saved others. In other words, we've heard all these people talk about how he's touched their lives and changed their lives. Himself, he cannot save. And again, a prophetic statement. Had he, had he focused on saving himself, he would have been no savior for you and me. And so they mocking him are, are forecasting, are speaking forth gospel truth, because this is the truth. In order to save us, he could not save himself. Then they say, let the Christ, and they, again, the king of Israel. If you've been with us, tracking through this, you, you should be kind of amazed at how many times this designation has come up from the lips of those who did not believe it. And here they are mocking. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down. They've called him the Messiah. They've called him the King. Come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. So you have the passers-by reviling him. You have the Jewish leaders reviling him. And then you have, if, you've, if you're familiar with the narrative, you have those hanging on either side begin to revile him. Yeah! Do what they say. We want to see it. And then we're told, of course, in the, when you read the full narrative, that one of them caught himself and said to his fellow criminal, what are we doing? We deserve to be here. This man does not. Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? So, so you see, he is from the cross, is gripped by the Spirit to see Jesus for who He is. What a great, encouraging word that should be for all of us. That You don't know anybody, listen to me, you don't know anybody who still has pink under the fingernail, who still has a pulse, who is beyond the reach of the grip of the grace of God. This man's tone changes, even though he had joined them initially reviling. And Jesus' wonderful answer, of course, was, I promise you this day, you'll be with me in paradise. You can get that close to Jesus, hanging next to him in his agony, and one completely miss it, and one have his eyes opened by the grace of God. This is the distinguishing, powerful grace of God. So, behold the king, the king of Israel, identified by those who did not believe it. Third, I want you to see his, he experiences the wrath of God. Verses 33 to 37, this, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, so now, so now we've moved from, from the time of his sixth hour is noon. We're told here that the whole land goes dark. When you're reading this, there are some things that should remind you from your study of Scripture. You remember when, when God was about to pull his final, powerful, sovereign, miraculous manifestation when his children were in bondage, that darkness enveloped the land of Egypt, except in the land of Goshen, where the Jews were living abject darkness. It's the, it's the powerful picture of the displeasure of God. 
And so, in the middle of the day, when the sun should have been at high noon, darkness. I heard a pastor preach years ago, Dr. Uh, Manuel Scott, powerful African-American preacher. And he said that so agonizing was the death of Jesus that it was a cosmic conflict in the heavens. And he said this, he said the sun, S-U-N, sun, went AWOL for a season of time. Even the sun disappeared. And what you find happening here, three hours of darkness had to be terrifying for all around because it was not normal. It was a phenomenon, a cosmological phenomenon. And at that ninth hour, after three hours of darkness, Jesus breaks forth with this cry. It is called the cry of abandonment, the cry of dereliction. It's the, it's the keen awareness of the Son of God that something he has never experienced has become his reality. Remember, Jesus comes to earth as Bethlehem's babe, having spent eternity in face-to-face -face fellowship with his Father. That's what, that's what John says in the, in the prologue of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he, the pictures he used was face to face in fellowship with God. When he was on earth, he would draw aside on regular intervals to spend time praying, communing with the Father. When he was a little boy, and taken to the temple for the first time that we have it recorded, and his parents are alarmed because they can't find him, and he says, that, what, Why would you be? Don't you know that? I must be about my father's business. There was, there was a union and communion with Jesus, the Son, and God, the Father. It was unbroken. Unbroken. Until now. When he cries out in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? This was his traumatic fear in the garden. When he who had had eternal face-to-face -face fellowship and communion with God experienced God turning his back upon his son as he poured out his wrath His divine wrath for you, for me, that would take us in eternity to satisfy. And Jesus took that. And the darkness, while physical around them, was spiritual for Jesus. For a season there on the cross, Jesus experiences hell. That's what divine torment is. It's hell. For a season of a few hours, Jesus absorbs an eternity of punishment for you and for me. Well, the people standing by, of course, misunderstood, as happens all throughout his ministry. Some hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And, and while the first thing that was offered him was a sedative, this is offered him here. This, this sponge with sour wine is not a sedative. They press it to him because they want to revive him. They do not want to lose him. They want, him to, they want the pain to endure they say, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come take him down. Mocking him still. And we're told that Jesus uttered a loud cry 
and breathed his last. And you know if you've read the seven last sayings of Jesus from the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he finishes. He finishes the sacrifice that he was born to undertake. He dies. He dies. This wondrous mystery of the eternal Son of God dying. This amazing love. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me? It must change the way that we speak of baby Jesus. It must change the way that we talk about and sing about the Incarnation. Born to die, that we might live. And notice finally, the response immediately to the death of Jesus. The curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And we won't go into all the details about, we've done this before, about how the curtain was made there. It was very thick cloth. You would have done well to tear it from, top, from bottom to top. It was thick. But to rip it from top to bottom was God's saying, the way is open. My wrath has been satisfied. There is no need to go annually into the Holy of Holies anymore. No need for a high priest to put on all of his vestments, to have a rope tied around his ankle, and go in there to minister continually on behalf of the people, shedding the blood of the sacrificed animals, doing the work, the bells of his vestment ringing, to know that he is still moving, that the high priest is never still. And it, all of that is gone. The veil torn in two. The way opened because you see... The high priest, Jesus Christ, has become the sacrifice and the sacrifice has satisfied God's divine justice. So the Hebrew writer says, for Jesus died once for all. Once for all. And the way is made for any sinner who will put his or her faith in Jesus Christ, trusting his perfect life, trusting his substitutionary death on the cross, believing that he rose from the grave three days later, any sinner from any station of life, from any part of the world, from any background, has a way to communion with God through the shed blood and righteousness of this precious Savior. That's God's response. There's a Roman response too. The centurion standing nearby, this master of death, this man who was the head of the cohort, who was assigned to execute criminals on the cross. This man stands and watches Jesus die and says, truly this man was the son of God. Again, not fully understanding. He's not making a confession of faith in Christ there, but he is recognizing of all the crucifixions I've seen, this one, this one is the crucifixion of someone who was clearly favored by God. Prophetically again, Jesus is declared for who he is from the mouth of one who unwittingly says it by the providence of God. Well, we're told there were also women there. And this is, you know, there's a women's movement been has been for years and people have failed to recognize that Jesus elevated women to a place they had not known before. And to this very day, a woman who finds her meaning and her being in, in Christ has the highest place of any woman in the world. And look at how different. The men fled. The men fled in fear and in panic. There were women looking on from a distance. Mary Magdalene, he had forgiven her, and delivered her. Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. Because when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. It's interesting. It's interesting. What a note. 
But in the day that the, that the men who had Jesus pour himself in their lives for three to three and a half years, when we put the text together in the Gospels, only one was there at the cross, and that's John, the youngest disciple. But several women were there near to him. And they would be the ones, as we will study further in Mark, they would be the ones who would go to the tomb. Fascinating. We won't get into that today, but with no thought of how, how we're going to be able to remove the stone, no th but go to anoint him properly for burial. And there, our Savior hangs. Jesus is, as you see, cleverly stated, the reason for the season. And the wreath is a beautiful accoutrement for the season. But the crown of thorns says it more clearly. And the nails in his hands speak it more plainly. When we come to this season of the year, remembering that Jesus lived and died and rose again, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that Jesus gave himself a ransom, that the Holy Spirit, they, the Father and the Son give the Holy Spirit. It is right to give gifts in this season of the year as an outworking of the heart that we serve and live by the grace of a giving God and a giving Savior. And so we can celebrate, perhaps through, through tears to remember the death of Jesus, but we can celebrate the wonderful mystery, the God of life being put to death. And we can say hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's alive. This isn't the end of the story. It's a, it's a tragic part of the story. Sweetly tragic. He's alive. God help us, who are followers of Jesus Christ today, to live as if he is alive. Brother Norman said it earlier. Yes. Speak the gospel. But live the gospel. Live a transformed life such a way that people want to know how is it that you find such joy in times like these well it's not because of who's not going to be president anymore and it's not because of who is going to be president and it's not because who is in congress or not in congress and it's not it's not any of those things because we have a savior we have a savior who lives who lived and died and rose again for us for those of you who are not yet followers of jesus christ you're thinking about giving things to family and friends this season and you should you're anticipating receiving gifts from family and friends this season and that is right but oh oh you will be derelict if you come through this season and you miss the greatest gift of all when Jesus says I will be yours I will be yours and by simple childlike faith in him you can receive him and receive the greatest gift of all. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and we thank you for this story. This amazing, wondrous story. Help us to receive it in a new and fresh way today. Help us to never grow weary of hearing it, but to gladly say, I... Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Or, I love to tell the story. Help this to be our theme now as we move to heaven. For those who are, who are Christ followers here, help us to live as if this life and death and burial and resurrection has truly gripped us and changed us. And for those who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, oh, dear God, would today, this season, be the time when they will come to know him and confess him and trust in him and be born again and be changed forever. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.